be looking at the last section of the Sermon on the Mount, um, and we, we find it in verses 24 uh, through 27, and then basically a bit of an epilogue in verses 28 and 29. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's begin by reading the text. There's nothing really, no, no place the Lord speaks to us more directly than when we read his word. And these words of Jesus may have been spoken many years ago, but they were meant as much for us as they were for that original audience. So this is what Jesus says. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house. And yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house. And it fell, and great was its fall." When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. Well, may the Lord again bless his word to our uh, hearing this evening. Now again, Jesus has told us that there are only two paths, a difficult path that leads to life and an easy path that leads to destruction. If we want to enter into life, we have to walk on the narrow path. We have to enter through the narrow gate. We have to walk on the difficult road. We don't, have a, we don't really have a choice. It's not optional. If we want to end up in life, that's where we have to go. Now, Jesus told us there's two kinds of teachers again, some that will teach us the truth about the road to life, how narrow it is, how difficult it is. And there will be those who will tell us lies, that the way is broad, that there's many ways that lead to God. Uh, that the path is easy, they'll try to broaden it. Jesus says we need to listen to those who will teach us the truth if we're going to arrive in heaven. Jesus told us this morning there's two ways that we can respond to his word. We can do lip service, we can call him Lord, but not submit to him, or we can call him Lord and submit to him. If we want him to receive us on that day, Jesus says we need to obey him, not just call him Lord, but actually submit to him as Lord. And we also noted, of course, that if we're trusting the Lord Jesus, believing in him alone for salvation, this is really what we're going to do because this is what the Spirit of God within our souls is actually moving us to do. This is our new nature. This is our new desire. And again, that will be true in all of these different areas. If we know the Lord, this is what in our hearts we really want to do. This is the kind of life that we're already living. Now, this evening, we come to Jesus' final challenge, which is the question, are we building our house on the rock or are we building it on the sand? Are we listening to what Jesus says? Have we trusted him? He tells us he's the only way to the Father. Are, are we coming to the Father through him? Uh, are we framing our lives by his teaching, building our lives on that, or are we building our lives on a foundation of sand? Are we turning a deaf ear to what Jesus says? Now, as in each of the previous tests, the choices we make are going to lead to two possible outcomes. If we build our house on the rock, then Jesus says, when difficult times come for our testing, we will stand. But if we build on the sand, these tests will actually destroy us. Jesus asks us this evening, are we going to be wise and listen to him, or are we going to be foolish and disregard what he has to say? So let's take a look at this parable and see again a little bit more particularly what Jesus is actually telling us here. First of all, let's consider the house in Jesus' parable, the house that uh, is being built. Now, in his typical teaching style, again, Jesus was a master at doing this. He would 
uh, draw from the culture. He would draw from imagery, things that people were familiar with in order to teach them things they weren't familiar with, things they could see so that they could learn more about things they couldn't see. And here he draws on another familiar image from that time and culture, which isn't so unfamiliar to us today, and that is the building of a house to teach us the importance of listening and doing what he's actually telling us to do. Now, the word house in, in the Greek, in the original language, can really mean uh, two different main things. First of all, it can refer to a literal house. Uh, as we know, a house is rather important uh, to, to our livelihood. It's somewhat of a, a necessity today as it was then. I mean, in those days, if a man was to have a place where he would be able to, uh, uh, you know, raise uh, uh, and provide for a family, uh, uh, for a wife and children, uh, he would either have to build a room onto his father's house, which was quite common in those days, but if that wasn't possible or it wasn't available to him, he would have to build a new house. People live in enclosures. People live in dwellings that are going to protect them from the elements. But, of, but because of the powerful storms that occasionally swept through the particular area that uh, the folks lived in that Jesus was speaking to, the house that they built had to be very strong. Uh, Adam Clark, who I believe was a, um, uh, I think he was a Methodist uh, commentator, writes in his comment, uh, commentary this, in Judea and in all countries in the neighborhood of the tropics, the rain sometimes fall in great, falls in great torrents, producing rivers which sweep away the soil from the rocky hills and the houses which are built of brick only dried in the sun, of which there are whole villages in the east, literally melt away before those rains and the land floods occasioned by them. Apparently it wasn't uncommon, especially among those houses that were built next to rivers for those rivers to swell and literally just wash away the houses that were there. If, if the house was to stand, it, it had to be built of sturdy materials and it also needed to be built on uh, an equally sturdy foundation. Now Jesus uses the building of a house to represent the lives, our lives, the lives that we are building. He says, if we would be wise, we need to build them in such a way that they would be able to stand against the storms, against the trials that the Lord actually is going to send in order to test the quality of our lives, to test the quality of our work. And we know from Scripture that, that He will do this both in this life and, of course, in the life to come. Uh, as we're going to see in just a few moments. Now, I mentioned that the word house can actually refer to two different things, and certainly Jesus is using the first meaning, that is the building of a literal structure, but it can also refer to a, a family, to one's house or one's household, uh, the blessing that the Lord gives, he often gives, uh, to us in our marriages. Uh, it, it is a blessing to have children, now again, though Jesus is using the word in the first sense, it's clear from what we're going to be looking at that the way we build our lives uh, can also have a profound impact on our children, uh, both for good or for bad. And of course, our hope is that the Lord will use us for good. And He will if we build our houses the way the Lord calls us to build them. Now, we need to, of course, uh, build Christian character. We need to be examples of what it is we're, we're actually telling them to do. We need to be faithful in teaching them the Lord's ways. And it will be a great blessing to them for their good uh, if the Lord graciously opens their eyes and their ears to His truth and to the beauty of His gospel. We do need to recognize that uh, there are many examples in Scripture where uh, God's people did what they were supposed to do. They exhibited uh, a godly example. They, they taught their household the truth. 
and yet they still saw them go away from the Lord. Uh, there is a teaching today that basically says if you do it right, then your kids are going to turn out exactly right. Uh, and if they don't, it's because you failed in some way, but that isn't the case. Uh, really, the, it's up to the Lord whether He's going to open ears and eyes and show them the truth of what we're saying. It's like when we go out to witness to somebody, if, if we tell them the truth and they're not saved, is that our fault? Well, no, if we've done what we're supposed to do, it's up to the Lord to take it from there. We can only tell them we can't actually change their hearts. The same thing is true with regard to our parenting and our households. We need to build our lives in a way that's honoring to the Lord. We need to do what He calls us to do. Uh, and again, it'll still be a blessing, as we're going to see also in a moment, to our household if we actually do this, whether they come to faith or not. Now, secondly, let's consider the two foundations. As we noted a moment ago, a house is only going to be as strong as the base upon which it's built. Jesus tells us there is a foundation, thankfully, that is strong and is sure. He calls it the rock, and there is also one that is weak and very uncertain. As a matter of fact, it's certain to fall. That's called the sand. Now, to build our lives on the rock is to trust Him and to do what He says. I mean, listen to what Jesus says in verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. Okay, so building our house on the rock is listening to what Jesus says and acting upon those words, doing what He says. Now, one thing that, that we, I think, need to step back and look at is, first of all, uh, hopefully we understand just how blessed we are actually to hear what it is that Jesus has actually said. There's many places in the world today that we were just praying about, actually, that the gospel has not yet reached. There's many people who have never actually had the chance and maybe never will have the chance. There are certainly people who have lived and died who have never actually heard about Jesus or had the opportunity to build their lives on the rock. All they have had is sand. Now, that isn't the case with us. We have heard the truth, and it's a blessing to have heard it. And really, we, we do need to think about this for a minute because we don't want to get so used to the fact that we've had this treasure, many of us have actually grown up with it, that we, actually, well, we take it for granted and we don't see its value uh, any longer. But how much more blessed are we that we've not only heard the truth, we know there's a rock, we know that there is a foundation that is firm and secure, but we've actually come to that rock. We've actually been saved by the Lord Jesus Christ and we are building our lives on it. Uh, so many people in our culture today actually have this treasure. They actually have the Word of God in so many different ways. They share this blessing of having the truth. They've been raised in Christian households and it's a tremendous blessing to have been raised by Christian parents and to have heard that truth even from an early age. It's a tremendous blessing. They perhaps heard the truth from family and from friends. There's churches everywhere that we can attend. Uh, they can turn their radios on. They can hear the word being read. They can hear it being explained and preached. Most people have a Bible. Uh, you know, the Gideons have, have done, again, a, a good job of getting the Bibles around. And they can open those Bibles anytime they want and read it. So many people have access to the Bible, but so many people disregard it because they don't see its value. Again, we need to see, first of all, how blessed we are that we know the foundation exists and that we have actually come to the rock and have trusted in Jesus. We have seen the, the value of this truth and seeing it, we have been building our lives upon it. Now, building on the rock, that's what we do when we hear the word and act on it, even as Jesus just told us. When we hear the gospel call, 
and come to Jesus in faith and repentance. That's where we begin when we go through the narrow door. And when we walk on the narrow road, when out of love for the Lord, we're turning from our sins and following Him. When we become more than just hearers of the Word, but also doers, and I think equally important, uh, remembering that what we do is not just our actions, but it's also what's in our hearts, what's in our thoughts, and what it is we, we actually say. It's important to build our lives in all of these areas. So to build our lives on the rock means to have Jesus as our only hope and to honor him as our only goal. But to build our lives on the sand, of course, is to do just the opposite. It's to ignore what it is that Jesus says and to build our lives on something else, to build our lives on anything else other than him. Jesus says in verse 26, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. We build our lives on the sand when we reject Jesus and his way of living. And we listen instead to the opinions of the world. When we build our lives on philosophy, when we build our lives on, on any type of philosophy, pragmatism or whatever it may be, utilitarianism, if it works, it's right. If it's good for most people, it's right. Or, you know, this, this very pragmatic approach to living. Or when we build our lives on any other religion and we put our trust, in, again, in, in works. Every other religion is essentially works-based and it's trusting, of course, in a false way of salvation in a false God and will not lead us to heaven. We, we build on sand when we, when we put our trust in our possessions, when we try to, as it were, amass wealth and trust that for our well-being in the future, or fame, popularity, things of, of this nature rather than Jesus. You know, the interesting thing is we can actually be in the church, be members of a church, and still be building our lives on sand. And that is, of course, when we're hearers and, and not doers, when we're happy just to look like Christians without really being Christians. When we do the right things, but we do them for the wrong reasons. When we profess to know Jesus, when we're baptized, we attend church, we attend, uh, well, attend to his word, listen to it, when we pray, when we try to help our neighbor and do the things that Jesus actually tells us, but we do them for the wrong reasons. Not because we love him, not because we want to honor him, but because we want others to think well of us. We want to keep up our appearances. Or if we actually think that we're doing these things to work our way to heaven. So we're building our lives on the sand when we don't make Jesus our only hope or his word our only rule. So finally, let's consider the storm. You know, the storm represents, as I mentioned earlier, what it is that God actually sends, you know, to test our lives. The reality of our profession, are we really genuinely believers? And the strength of our commitment to Him. Now, it's interesting that as Jesus gives us this parable, both of the houses in this parable seem to be doing fine until God sends something in order to test them. And these come first in the form of, of trials. Okay? Trials are meant to test us. Trials are meant to prove our faith, to see whether it's genuine, whether it's real. Uh, James writes in, in James chapter 1, verse 12, Blessed is, is a man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. You see, the, the trial shows whether or not we genuinely trust the Lord, whether we genuinely love the Lord, and it's because when the trial comes, we don't let go of him, but we continue to persevere. Now, trials are meant not just to test the genuineness of our faith. They're also sent to uh, stretch our faith to, um, you know, if our faith is actually genuine, if it's actually real, 
to strengthen our faith, to actually stretch it to the breaking point so that it can become stronger. James writes also in his, um, in his letter, in chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. So the Lord actually will send these trials to, again, to test our foundation and to test our building to see how strong it is and actually to make it stronger. But for a trial to accomplish this, it has to be, in some cases, fairly severe. Uh, the stronger we happen to be, the stronger our building may be, the stronger our lives are, the, you know, the, again, the more mature we are, the, so, the more severe it has to be in order to make us stronger. So if the Lord actually puts us through difficult times, if he, if he sends great trials as he did in the case of Job, it must be because we already have a strong faith. You realize there's no way that Job could have endured what the Lord sent unless he had had a genuine faith and a strong faith and the Lord actually never would have tested him beyond what he was able to endure if he didn't already know he had given him the grace to endure that. God will never test us beyond what we can endure by his grace. We will endure every trial, Jesus says, if our lives are built upon him. Look at what he says again in verse 25. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house. And yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. If our lives are built on the rock, they will weather the trials and the difficulties that the Lord brings in to our lives. But let's not forget that trials can also show that we don't actually have genuine faith, that we haven't trusted in the Lord Jesus, that our foundation is essentially sand. It, it, it shows it when we fold or collapse under the weight of that trial. Jesus says in verses 26 and 27 of our text, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell and great was its fall. If we are not founded upon the Lord Jesus Christ, there's no guarantee that we're going to be able to weather any of the trials that the Lord actually sends. We will collapse. We will essentially be undone. Now, the ultimate test, of course, is going to come when we stand before the Lord on that final day, when we stand before Him in order to examine our lives, to look at what it is we've actually built. Now, our Lord tells us that if we have built our house, our lives on the rock, if we've been doers of the Word and not hearers only, that we will stand. Remember what we read this morning, the sheep and goat judgment. What was the difference between the sheep and the goats? The sheep were those who did what the Lord called him to do. Uh, the goats were those who didn't do what the Lord called them to do. But if we have done what the Lord has called us to do, again, by his grace, we will be able to stand in the day of judgment. And we will hear the Lord Jesus Christ say to us, as he will say to all the sheep in Matthew 25, 34, Come, you who are blessed of my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. But of course, if we built our lives on sand, if we've been hearers only and not doers of the word, Jesus will say to us, as we will be numbered among the goats in verse 41, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Remember what we saw this morning as we were looking at Matthew uh, chapter 7, this last text, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And then he says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform any miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. 
Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now again, why is Jesus saying these things? Well, remember, he is talking to a mixed crowd. He's talking to his disciples, and even among his disciples, there was one that didn't belong to him. And there were many others who were gathered around to listen to him. Jesus was saying these things because he was, he was basically beginning his work of discrimination, his work of separation, even as he's going to do on the day of judgment. You know, the, the separation doesn't begin on the day of judgment. The separation begins in life. His word is what makes a separation between the sheep and the goats. Now, he knew that when he said these things, that there would be those there that would actually listen to him those who were his sheep. But there would also be those there who wouldn't listen to him, which didn't necessarily mean that they weren't sheep. They may have been sheep whose time had not yet come. But of course, if they continued not to listen to him and not to do what he said, they would you know, eventually prove themselves to be goats. Jesus was calling out his sheep, those who would listen to him, those that would actually do what he was telling them to do. He was making a separation. So the Lord does the same thing for us this evening. He's making a separation through his word. And if we want to know that we are actually his sheep and that we will be able to stand through these trials on the day of judgment, we have to be those who listen to Jesus and who do what he says. Remember what Jesus says in John chapter 10, verses 27 and 28. He says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. So who are the sheep? Well, again, they are those who hear his voice and who respond, who actually follow him. These are the ones he gives eternal life to. These are the ones who will never perish and no one or, or nothing will ever take them away from him. Now, Jesus tells us, again, that there is a storm that is coming, not just the storms and trials of life, but there is a storm that is coming that will try our hope and will test our foundation, and certainly it is that day of judgment. If our hope is built upon the Lord Jesus Christ, we will stand. But if our hope is built on anything else, we will fall. And so Jesus says to us this evening, be wise. Be like the wise man. Listen to him. Build your house on a firm foundation. Jesus, remember, knows what he's talking about. He is God in human flesh. He is the great prophet sent by God to tell us what it is that God requires. This is how we know the truth and he has told us these things so that we might be prepared for it. Even the crowds who were gathered around him, Matthew tells us, were amazed with the, uh, the kind of authority with which Jesus was teaching that only he could do. He says in verses 28 and 29 as sort of an epilogue, when Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. He was not even just a messenger who was, uh, as it were, relating what it is that God was saying. He is the Word of God, the great prophet who speaks and tells us God's will, God's truth for us and for our salvation. So if we do what Jesus tells us to do, we can know that we will be safe. May He give us then the grace actually uh, to do that. Let, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's, let's ask the Lord to help us truly to listen to him and follow him.